Welcome to this EHL uh, recap session uh, about service quality and design um, based on the course of Professor Najar. So uh, I understand the courses are quite different, but I hope there's still some um, from uh, Professor Stiran, some students that can take away some stuff. Uh, hello to everyone in class. Uh, can you see my screen and uh, can you hear me well online and in class? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Fantastic. OK, um, we have a quick rundown. I'm uh, uh, just going to uh, say tell something, some stuff uh, before. So you can ask any questions you like at any time uh, you want. Uh, my goal is to go over the basic concepts once again, not too much into detail because almost all the concepts are very intuitive. Um, it's in that sense quite an easy course. What's really important is you do the mock exam, for example, that's available in LMS as well. Um, so to get a bit of training and see a bit how um, the questions are asked and what logic you have to apply to uh, find the answers. Because uh, Professor Nazar, for example, has quite a specific way of asking questions and of how he wants uh, us to respond. So yeah, uh, the game plan for today, um, we'll go through all the chapters that we've seen. Um, I'm not gonna read them all out. And at the end is some answers to your questions. A Q and A session quickly, but of course, as I said, you can ask uh, if you have any questions for a concept. I can go into more detail if you want me to. Otherwise, I'll keep it a bit uh, superficial, so uh, I can leave you guys uh, within more or less one hour, one hour, fifteen minutes, so we don't take too much of your time. Perfect. Let's begin with the intro summary. This is uh, the introduction that we had in the first uh, one or two weeks. Um, and I've just tried to break it down and compress it as much as possible uh, and as clearly as possible as well. So we have different perspectives of quality, right? Um, there is six different ones and there's a, we start with the product perspective and which means it's the pro product attributes and features. And there are three principles according to Dr. Juran. And Dr. Juran is, um, is we talked about, is uh, one of the leading um, entrepreneurs when it comes to quality management. Uh, he was he, he is American as I as far as I'm concerned, or he was at least uh, during the 20th century, and he really applied certain principles and they're still used for uh, quality management. Uh, for, first of all, it's the Pareto principle, the 80/20 rule. I think most of you guys know this. Um, well, you can apply it in a lot of different ways. Here, for example, uh, he applied it that a small percentage of root causes in manufacturing account for a large. Um, effect in the defects of or cost. Um, so uh, make sure that you pay attention to detail is pretty much what he's saying here. Then the management theory is um, you have to really change the thinking from quality of the end product to the human decision the dimension. Um, and it's all about education, educating and training managers um, and other human factors, especially because of the Juran, um, he was in the manufacturing business where it's mostly about things, mostly about um, building stuff, then you definitely don't have to uh, count, uh, even, forget, even there you can't forget the uh, human factor. That's of course in our hospitality industry um, very much uh, predominant. Then the journal trilogy is the quality planning, the design stage, the quality control, and quality improvement. That's basically his three um, principles that he's also applied. Then second pr uh, quality perspective is the user perspective which is fitness for intended use. Um, well, uh, does the product match uh, or what I want? And um, can I actually use it for what is it intended? Then transcendent perspective is excellence. Um, it's something that's not very tangible. It's uh, something that's initially understood, but not physical. Uh, manufacturing perspective, conformance to requirements. Um, and there is a very important from a manufacturing perspective that you do things right the first time. Sorry. Uh, one second. I just have to quickly take a break because there is music playing. I don't know how to turn it off. Text him. Oh, text him first, yeah. Text him. Uh, hello, we just lost connection with our tutor. We will try to get him back as soon as possible. Uh, 
So, uh, yes, as yeah, said, there's currently a party going on. Sorry, guys. Uh, so I had to just uh, tell the 50 plus year olds that uh, the party has to be a bit quiet at, even at this time. Here we go. Let's continue. So, um, yeah, we were at the manufacturing perspective and everything that you do, of course, you do it right the first time. That's super important because if you not do it right the first time, then you have to redo and it often takes more time and costs more um, than when you do it right the first time. Then value perspective, uh, functional, experiential and symbolic value. And of course, cost sacrifice value are uh, different factors here. Oh, well, functional is and I think it's pretty much self-explanatory um, what you can have because it always depends on uh, of course, then from the consumer, what do you value most and which of the values you have there. Then the customer perspective um, is either external or internal. Um, and the customer in the end is the one who defines quality. And that's really the takeaway from this uh, introduction is that you can try and build the perfect car. You can try and provide the best service. But in the end, who is judging that is not you who thinks that if you, all your procedures are great, all your... Uh, staff is great and uh, the end it's the customer who decides that and um, yeah that's really important that you understand that there might be some discrepancies and we're gonna go over that in the gap analysis later but uh, yeah that's uh, quite a broad spectrum and uh, ideally of course customer um, define quality perception is um, quite close to what you have in hand. Now um, static and dynamic quality um, dynamic quality is unpatterned, so it's something that's it's not really measurable. Um, it's being recognized, but uh, yeah, it's breaking and it's breaking stability. So it's really not something that you can uh, assess with SOPs, for example. Uh, it's really something that is that is changing, and it's creating a moment of truth, and it's something that's a smile and the right place or. A, an employee helping um, at a certain stage that was not expected. So it's really something that's that's variable um, and can can uh, vary yeah quite a lot. And static quality is of course this is normally what we expect. This is standard. This is the baseline that has to be correct. This is, it's patterned. Um, it's stability and endurance, and it's uh, yeah even the static system can change over time. That's also something that's important. That doesn't mean a static quality cannot change at all. It can change but it's actually very uh, measurable and comparatively uh, static. Then seven quality management principle uh, as per ISO. Uh, ISO is um, certification for um, companies. They do different, have different numbers, which stands for different certifications. Um, and here, quality management, really the seven factors that ISO is looking at, which is globally recognized, is leadership, customer focus, engagement of people, Processes approach, continual improvement, evidence-based decision making, and relationship management. Um, all I think uh, you've you've heard of. So I'm not going to spend uh, too much time here and go back no further. So uh, future quality influences, of course, uh, what we are looking at as well um, in different classes at EHL here. This is basically a summary: uh, global responsibility, awareness of consumer AI, workforce of the future, and aging population. Um, innovation, globalization, um, all of that that we are uh, trying to account for. And that's really a much our generation that has to think about that when implementing uh, different quality structures and uh, services as well. Now, innovation. Um, well, what is innovation? It's something that creates value, revenue. Uh, it's creative, but not necessarily new. Uh, what that means is, and uh, the professor talked about this in class, it's innovation is not really necessarily, you have to invent something completely new. Like for example, Steve Jobs did with um, Apple and the iPhone or the iPad, but also taking something that's already existing and making it better through adding a certain technology, adding a certain service, adding a um, certain structure that has not been there before, enhancing something. That's also innovation. Then it's also reducing cost. Well, you have to find innovative ways to reduce cost um, in a business, of course, as we know, especially hospitality, where the margins are quite small. Um, this, in, mo in a lot of cases, they're trying to do that with salary cuts or something like that, uh, where you can also be quite innovative, not necessarily for the best for the employees, of course. But uh, yeah, that's something that's uh, being done there. Uh, it has to be accepted 
customers. Of course, it doesn't matter if you're super innovative. If the customer doesn't accept it, then it's basically um, yeah, uh, not worth anything. And it must be replicable, right? Uh, if it's just a one-time thing that you cannot uh, rep uh, replicate, um, it's really not uh, not worth doing it at all. And the whole, all the cost that you spent before is really not worth it. Now, innovation um, is there's one of the um, uh, this is a chart that we have here of business management. You have basic innovation management, knowledge management, and quality management. And well, how it works. Innovation and quality management are technically separate, but not really, because everything that's in between that's being learned will influence both um, ways, of course. And here uh, we are looking on the left-hand side is the quality management part, which is the ISO standards, and it's really about continuous improvement. And that's what uh, Professor Nader also talked a lot about in his class and uh, repeated uh, a lot of times as well. So innovation. Um, it should invest in the people who want to improve their own process. And it's really about measuring and understanding it. Um, and you should never have to ask for permission for process optimization. That's something that not even, not necessarily a manager has to do, but it's also every employee can have a good idea to um, optimize a process. Maybe sometimes management is too far away, um, which is then a management mistake, but that's a different story. Uh, and can't see something that's operational, that how something works, right? And if you do, if you op optimize your process, then uh, then do it. And as long as it's safe, of course, um, you you have to be able to do that. And uh, as an employee as well. And then the so-called Black Swan events. Uh, Black Swan is um, a book, highly recommended. Actually, um, you can um, find it online. It's about about the surprising event that make you reevaluate re your own belief systems. So, what Black Swan events are in a sense is, imagine you're uh, viewing only white swans, right? You have only seen white swans in your life, and you assume that all swans are white. And then suddenly you see a black swan, and suddenly this changes everything, right? For you, you have to reevaluate re how you see swans, so that there might be two different colors. Um, and then you have to adapt according to that. It's something that you can't predict necessarily, but you still have to adapt to this. And the survival of the fittest versus survival of the fitting, um, there are two different um, approaches, and we see a lot in nature documentaries, especially it's survival of the fittest, which means it's the strongest, the one who is um, best suited, and that's in, a, in the animal kingdom, you can see that quite a lot. And But also survival of the fitting. So if you're in an environment that you're not fitting into and that you're not comfortable with, it's much harder to survive. And also here we're using the animal kingdom for some uh, reference points um, uh, in the survival of the this uh, of the stages and well the, the as also here written the species which is most adapted uh, will survive in the end and it's because it's the most innovative for this specific um, environment so here we have uh, the four different ones that we've talked about in class early bird parrots bears and frogs um well i'm not going to go over all of them i think the for example the powerpoint is available as well um so early birds are valuable companies because they are pretty much the, the, per, the people who go first. Um, probably it's not their primary concern because they are really innovative and they try to do something else. It's high risk, however, and very few are successful. It's, for example, startups, right? If you're trying to build a startup, um, you are trying to bring your new ideas into it. Uh, however, you don't know how it's being perceived by the market. So yeah, that's really how, uh, how this is goes. The parrots are the fast movers. Um, and also they repeat what others have said. Well, this is a kind of a pair of thing, right? Um, they replicate the innovation and try to go as fast as possible. Um, and they become profitable at it. And they're, uh, they pretty much have no spending on R&D because of course the early birds have taken care of that. Then bears, uh, late adopters are, uh, they need quite a long time to catch up, but they're highly efficient um, because they have low cost because of course, stuff has been established before and frogs then in the end you do not they do not change the strength the strength is in their precision they have kind of a bureaucratic approach to everything and they want to keep the status pro and prevent newcomers from entering the market so this is for example what apple is doing um when uh expanding their ecosystem what's any new product that comes into their ecosystem they're either trying to make their own product so they can force the 
that is more integrated into the ecosystem because they, of course, have the key to that, or they are trying to buy it um, and integrate it in the ecosystem. So there is really no um, competition in there. That's uh, where how how Apple, for example, operates uh, quite well there as a frog or a bureaucrat. Now, um, here we have three managerial problems. Uh, there's the entrepreneurial problem. Well, the, here the problem mainly is how to develop it. Uh, how is a specific good service or target market or target segment? What that is, is basically if you're starting a new company, right? Um, think about an idea you have, maybe a good idea, and you're trying to do something about it and you want to found a company. This is very hard because you have quite a lot of administrative stuff to do. You don't really know where to start always. And you don't even know how if it's going to be successful or not. So this is the beginning problem. But engineering is how to create a system which operationalizes management solution uh, to the operation entrepreneurial problem. So then again, if you have the entrepreneurial problem solved, there is still the problem of uh, engineering and how to produce it, how to pr produce, replicate the service. And then administrative in the end, um, how can you um, reduce uncertainty? within the organizational system. So you have to build optima, uh, an optimal way. You have to build your administration and your organization so that there is the least uncertainty and the most consistency in uh, your organization. Then, as we've seen here, um, innovation defender, prospector, and analyzer. It's quite a big table. Um, also linked to the bears, frogs, parrots, and early birds that we've seen just before. Um, here as well, just a graphic. Uh, also, you can see that um, in the slides. Um, what's actually here important is that innovation appears faster today than it did before. Um, and also, it actually appears faster than customers' needs, which is, for example, um, also again, I'm taking Apple here uh, with the iPad. Um, Apple, Apple, or they did, they did not know that anyone needed the iPad because it has not existed before. And they've created that, and now they've created basically consumer needs um, because of that, because of their invention. Um, also, if products and services become too sophisticated or expensive and complicated, this is really not, um, this can also happen then. And of course, here in the bottom, you have the newcomer who is actually, yeah, changing the game, who is completely new, completely innovative, and um, very threatening to the status quo. For certain companies and that's then called disruptive innov innovation now <clears throat> uh, different logos of innovation um well we have uh, the core value is the firm and its supply base um that's the need for the operation then you have the extended enterprise which is networks integrations and solution innovation uh, and then of course even bigger is experience network experience um, personalization that's really uh, something that's uh, that's much larger than um, what you can actually grasp and necessarily influence as a company and your supplier directly. Now, <clears throat> here we have the um, BOS, uh, current sort of BOS. So it's about cost, either cost saving uh, and buyer value, and what this is the blue ocean strategy called. Um, well, what you're basically doing is you're you're saving costs based to the non-essential non values. Uh, well, a reduction of non-essential values, um, cost advantages due to economics economies of scale. So you basically what that means you're producing much more, and you're obtaining a superior value obtained thanks to the ra uh, race and creation of the value attributes that really matter to the mass of buyers. And uh, that's blue ocean strategy here. Uh, there is uh, we've talked about red and blue ocean. Um, at the red ocean, you're basically competing in an, uh, in an existing market space, and you really have to beat the competition, um, exploit existing demand, and make the value cost trade off, and align the whole system with the firm's activities to the strategic choice of differentiation or low cost. It's really about beating and trying to drive out the um, existing competition in the market in the red ocean strategy compared to the blue ocean strategy. Now, how do you measure innovation fitting? Um, that's what we've talked about uh, just before, is uh, how do you fit into um, the whole thing? It's, well, it's about leadership, management, training, 
um, a whole lot of different uh, uh, factors that, are, uh, well, attribute to the uh, measure of uh, fitting the innovation. Um, and you can see them all here. They're listed as of uh, Professor Nazar's um, slides. Now, uh, number three, which is chapter three, service strategy, uh, the competitive advantage is something that, um, well, that's uh, number A, for example, is something that only your uh, company can provide to the customer. And this is the one that gives you the competitive advantage. And this is what other uh, uh, firms or companies cannot provide. Um, how do you understand that? How can you understand this circle, which, which is looks on, on the base very simple, but it's actually quite difficult to understand? Um, you have to, of course, do the SWOT the pastel analysis that we've seen in marketing and BOSC one as well, and also during this semester sometimes. And you, of course, have to adapt your vision and mission because um, this might change as well. And in order to get this advantage, you might have to adapt. Then, uh, what is the VUCA ver world? Um, well, uh, there is uh, some interesting video that uh, his uh, Professor Nader has posted on uh, his slides. Um, basically, VUCA means, stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, of course, nowadays we are in this uh, so-called VUCA world, uh, which we have a lot of frequent changes, um, price fluctuation, because of course everything is connected. Um, everything reacts much quicker um, to any event uh, around the globe. I'm seeing GameStop, for example, um, where um, this is being trolled. So the price fluctuations there were quite uh, drastic because of um, everyone being able to, uh, small investors being able to um, join together and drive out um, big investors. So uh, that's volatile. Then uncertain, we cannot really predict and prioritize factors. It's really something that you can never do. And even though we have quite advanced technology, In the end, uh, we, there's human decision-making process behind it, and that makes it quite uncertain. Of course, complexity is the number of factors that you include, um, how much you're extending it, and there are so many moving parts that you cannot, of course, not control everything. And ambiguous uh, past experiences are useless for new processes, basically. What you see is um, you cannot always say the status quo because that will not help in the future. To some extent, it will for maybe some low innovation areas, but nowadays um, it's very ambiguous. Now service strategy, uh, here we have the vision statement, mission statement, service strategy, and then you go basically from top down uh, to what actually you're doing in the end. And this is very important that you're keeping this in mind. This is a tree that starts from the top. And if you don't have a good vision, you're not really likely to have a good mission and you cannot go down. So this is really important that you're sometimes when you're when your financial and budgeting planning is is shit, uh, to be honest, then you uh, have to go back and see, okay, where does uh, this come from? And it might not be just because you cannot do financing or you uh, haven't paid attention in TE for in FA, but maybe that's actually something that's a, a more uh, a problem that's more upwards on the tree. Maybe something to do with the service strategy or with the mission statement. And here we, are, of course, we are looking at the service strategy, which is basically more or less in the middle of the whole um, tree. Now, so what we're doing is basically the mission and you have, uh, this is basically a circle because in the end you are, it's a continuous, as we said before, it's continuously improving, right? At least it has to be at least. Um, so the goals, and then you have the desired outcomes. You define that. You define the goals, desired outcomes. So how do we get there? And that's then the strategies. Uh, measures and targets, it's important that you measure something because of course we have to have smart goals that are attainable and measurable. Um, and then of course you have to evaluate the whole thing. Um, well, what is the result of this mission? Did we succeed? Did we not succeed? How well did we succeed? And how well, if not, what did we do wrong? And then you have to formulate new goals and so on and so on. This is basically the whole process as it works. If one of those factors is not respected, then the whole circle doesn't work because you cannot then try to continuously improve. So you really have to pay attention to all five of those steps. Now, um, <clears throat> what you have, of course, is um, different um, players in the market and different um, 
uh, the different rivalries. So you have, so for example, supplier and buyer, which then they have basically bargaining power in, in both uh, ways. And there are substitute products or services and potential new entrants. And all of those have different um, different uh, aspects and different fact can bring different uh, factors to this competitive competitive rivalry. Um, and also that's what you have to be aware of, right? What substitute products are around you? What possible new entrants do we have in the market? Um, are they maybe better as, um, as we are? Do they understand the market better than we do? And so on and so on. And of course you have to bargain with suppliers and buyers to get the price um, low with buyers, of course, it's a law of demand and supply um, that you have to respect and find the common ground there. Now, um, service strategy, we are looking at from a resource-based view. There are, uh, this is the one we're looking at here. It is resources is what do we have and competence, what we do well. Those two things are important. Because this is will ensure the long time survival and you get will let you have the competitive advantage for a longer time. If you have good resources and good competence, then uh, it works well. Otherwise, it does not at all, which is um, one doesn't work without the other. And this is really important that you have those two together because to maximize your competitive advantage. Um, <clears throat> key competences, competences and assets are generally not outsourced, uh, which make, makes obviously sense. Um, because this is what gives you the competitive advantage. So you should ideally focus on something that your company does that you do yourself. Like, for example, a restaurant who is specializing in uh, pizza, uh, right? Uh, pizzeria, they don't, are not outselling, outsourcing the dough making process, for example. So they're not buying the pizza dough from a, from another pizzeria or from a, from a butcher. They might, if you are a Domino's Pizza, for example, uh, maybe they, they they would do that because they have there's a different uh, business model. But generally, as an independent restaurant, uh, something you have to do the core uh, business you have to do yourself. And then there's some redundant capabilities that are not used anymore, which may be even resources or can be competencies that you that you that have been implemented maybe for a long time, but they you can eliminate because they are just not useful anymore. And that's where we also come back to the VUCA world that we had before. It's volatile and it's ambiguous, right? You don't know what you have now if it's that's still valid in tomorrow or in a few years. And of course, the dynamic capabilities, you have to be adaptable. You have to, your competencies and your resources must be as adaptable as possible to suit any changes that might happen. Um, for example, here as well in the um, Corona pandemic, we can see, for example, restaurants who have already had a good takeaway concept. This is a dynamic capability, right? Now, yeah, perfect. Um, restaurants, they had that already. Perfect. They said, okay, cool. Maybe we have to. We can't welcome any more guests. There will be a bit of a redu uh, reduction in our revenue. But hey, uh, we can still have a. We already have a super good takeaway uh, system. We have the book boxes already printed, and we can just focus a bit stronger on that side. And this is really where you have to factor in as many different um, factors that might affect your business in the future as possible. So this will give you the competitive advantage overall. Now, uh, here we have, of course, different um, another tree with well a graphic which is pretty uh, more or less simple. That different competencies um, affect different um, differently the business. Uh, you have different core products, and then you go have maybe different businesses that go that then produce a lot of end products as well. So, for example, a uh, core product of Apple, maybe I'm just sticking with Apple, I think, for this presentation now, um, it would be their uh, system, their um, iOS system. So, out of this, they can then have they have the Mac business, they have the iPhone business, um, and they have some uh, other uh, stuff as well. So, for example, iPhones, they have a ton of different iPhones. They have the three different iPhones with every generation, um, and then of course different generations that they're selling, and of course Macs as well. They have MacBooks, they have um, the desktops uh, and everything else. So this is really, um, you have to define the define the rules of your competitiveness. And really, Apple is a very good example here because really their competitive advantage is really because of their, the, and almost, as we said, an ecosystem that they have created around themselves. And if you can create that as a company, then you're, and you're the only one there, then you're basically in a, in a monopoly um, in that sense. And of course, it's also important that the 
a core product are not directly um, for the end user. It's it's used to build um, something that is um, used for the uh, end user. And of course, if you can build, the more you can build, the more you can um, extract from the from the customer in the end, right? Because then you can always slightly adapt and more differentiate and and personalize the core product um, in the end to a customer. Now, what is the real model framework? Well, uh, something uh, service strategy, is it valuable, rare, imitated and organized? And what is the result? Um, so what you can see here, um, you basically have to ask yourself those questions and if you can um, answer, the more you can answer with yes, um, from left to right, the better, of course, your competitive advantage is. And for example, if you have the second lowest is three yeses, it's unused competitive advantage because if it's uh, imitated, um, if it's rare and valuable, all yes, that's great, that's fantastic. But if it's not or properly organized, then there is no use for it, right? There, well, you can't really use it and there's also not going to be um, a good way of um, having a good relationship with the customer there. Now, what is the difference between Vrin and Vrio? Um, Vrin is valuable, rare, imitable, and non-substitutable, and the Vrio is an uh, organization. Of resources um, here. Now, competitive advantages, of course, as we've seen, is a clear vision and mission, and the whole tree, as we've seen it before. Understanding what, uh, what you're doing in this VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, um, ambiguous, um, and the C is, sorry, I don't, <laughs> I forget, just forgot that one. Um, yeah, of course, you have to define your market, understand your competitors, and define your value proposition. So, really, all of those factors attribute to then having your competitive advantage, which of course is how you are establishing yourself and making in the end uh, making profit. Now, different service strategies uh, we have well, low cost uh, and broad is then cost leadership. Um, that's basically just having a very uh, low price and it's basically industry-wide, which means, for example, EasyJet, we can use this as an advantage, uh, as an example, for example, they are here, uh, they're one of the airlines that are really um, having pretty low cost comparatively, where you can add on, of course, a lot of stuff, but their base price is very low, uh, and they are basically used by business people and by people who go on vacation as well, so it's basically the whole uh, market segment. Then, uh, the whole market, actually. Then, if you go on product and service uniqueness, but uh, you're very broad, it's still you're differentiating yourself because you really are targeting everyone, but you still have a very unique style of doing something. And uh, then if you go low cost and narrow uh, to a narrow market segment, you go to a focus strategy, which is also low cost. Um, you really are trying to go to, for people who really are, um, uh, uh, have, have done, have a lot of money maybe for example if you go for students um, at our age you maybe adapt a product that is really low cost but is very focused because especially adapted to the students and of course if you go to uniqueness and a narrow market segment that's differentiation and we all know uh, plenty of um, different businesses there rolls royce would be one um, and anything that's really personal and fitting to a very narrow market segment now here a bit more, uh, a few more explanations about the different uh, strategies. And differentiation is everything is access to leading scientific research, a strong sales team, and good use of all levels of the value chain. So, well, this is basically what you have to uh, have to be good at to um, to succeed. And of course, uh, for cost leadership, you have to be super efficient in your processes. You have to have super high bargaining power um, because you have to, of course, cut costs. And uh, yeah, you have to outsource efficiently. And that's also something that's uh, that's there. Um, then, of course, for low cost, you have to really uh, be able to focus, focus, you have to be able to exploit uh, customer be cost behavior. Uh, this is what we have been looking at, I think, in hospitality economics, about price discrimination as well. It's very important because you know um, exactly where you can set a price and where you can tweak the pricing so it still works for you. And of course, uh, then the focus differentiation is really where you have a high customer loyalty. 
this is what you have to have because you have a very narrow uh, market segment. And if your your mark, uh, your customers are deviating, then of course you're not gonna uh, get any value out of them uh, a lot. Of course, you we're looking at then later and the lifetime value of a customer um, in a few slides, uh, where yeah, that's actually a major import, uh, importance for a lot of businesses. Now, here we go. Um, we have margins, of course, if we go from the tip, and then we have everything else that actually um, implements or influences the service strategy, which is the support activities and the primary activities. This is um, important that you know and can distinguish um, in your business between the primary activities that you're doing and your uh, supporting activities. And all of this gives you then the uh, margin that you can uh, sort of a wiggle room where you can operate in as well. Um, yeah, perfect. And then, well, the different age questions, of course. Um, who do we serve? What do we offer? How do we deliver the value? And so on and so on. Um, that you have to ask ask yourself. I don't think he's going to ask stuff like that in the in the exam, but it's just uh, nice to know um, to see how that uh, how that works. Now, service design process. Um, What's interesting here in chapter four is that, well, well uh, we have uh, the design of the process is, is basically what we've been talking about before. You have to have a good processes in place to have the competitive advantage to deliver better value for customers and so on and so on. And for service, it's quite uh, hard because as we know, all know, it's uh, service is time perishable and it's often intangible. And the customer is very much involved in the experience and it's actually part of producing that that service. So uh, here we have uh, two different graphs. We have uh, people and tangible actions, uh, which are beauty salons, for example, uh, something that you can see, of course, uh, also a hairdresser, for example, could be, okay, you're cutting your hair. It's a service. Yes, it's a service that's provided, but you can see it definitely uh, um, um, a, a difference, right? Um, Laundry and dry cleaning is uh, for things, of course, people and things here. And then in the intangible actions are direct at, directed at people's minds. Um, something that's a service that's for people is, for example, as we said, theater, theater here, uh, something that's not really tangible. You can buy a ticket, yes, but in the end, the service that you're looking for is a play that you're going to watch there. And of course, intangible actions and things is banking. Uh, it's something that's quite abstract, you're not really... Uh, going there are also lawyers is a, is a thing that, that you they don't see, you don't have an you don't have a tangible action in a sense uh, but you what you're getting out of is um, well they might for courts in they might defend you better in court so you walk uh, you're a free person and so on and so on which is um, going on there and then of course um, <clears throat> the relationship between service organization and its customers membership uh, and no formal relationship of course membership and um, uh, there is continuous delivery of service and discrete uh, transactions where we have, have um, of course, uh, that uh, relationship. And maybe interesting to see is non-formal relationship and discrete transaction um, is fine dining restaurant. And this is here because generally um, you don't have a, a lot of uh, regular clients in uh, fine dining restaurant. There are people who do that once uh, a year and even then go to different uh, fine dining restaurants. And it is um, very discreet from uh, what what uh, they're selling. So this is uh, why it is there in this category. Yes, it's perfect. Then there is also, of course, uh, from services, uh, it's a degree of customer uh, customization. Um, how much can you um, interact with the service and how much can you customize it? So, um, and there's of course a degree of labor intensity. So here, for example, uh, for low uh, labor intensity and low uh, interaction, we have fast food restaurants as, a, as an example. Um, you generally have your menu type. What you can customize is really um, how you set together your menu, but not really the product itself. Then more for a traditional restaurant, you can really go, it's uh, comparatively low intensity intensity of labor, um, but definitely high personalization because you can ask, okay, I have this uh, dietary um, 
requirements. Okay, can you change the dish for me? Yes, of course we can, and so on and so on. And then, of course, uh, higher labor demand and highest is the gourmet restaurant and the fine dining restaurant that we've been talking about. It's really where you have to be super specific to your customer and you can definitely uh, interact and customize very precisely. That's why also people pay a very high price for that. Now, um, what we're looking here, everything that all the chapters we're looking here at the, this point is uh, pre-experience. And then we have the participation and the post-experience that we have. And a service really um, has to affect for those three, uh, account for those three different uh, parts. Everything pre-experience is what you are trying to do with uh, marketing, with uh, promotion and expectations. And then you have the participation, right? Uh, how that's uh, that's the service is being done. And then after that, how the follow-up is in uh, in the service. And that's how, how that goes. And then, of course, important is that from the post experience, from what you've learned there, you go, uh, you banking this, those memories. So, for example, um, in a hotel, that would be if a guest checks out and they would say, OK, uh, I have liked that and that I might I would have liked to have oranges instead of apples in my uh, room. Right. So you're writing that down nowadays with the uh, PMS systems. It's very easy to do that. But uh, in the older old times and uh, there have been uh, notebooks for the hotel staff and all those memories are banked. Then you can specifically again advertise. You can actually uh, customize even more to the uh, to the guest and then uh, improve this uh, whole experience process. And of course, those bank memories, if you do it right and if you um, do it well enough, then you have a super high brand loyalty, which is what uh, you obviously want. Now, um, here, if you're designing a process, um, this is everything that's you basically divide it by the line of visibility. So everything that's back backstage and everything that's front stage. So what you are doing behind is a support process or support processes first, and then there are the backstage employee um, stuff that's being um, that's being done. Um, bringing order to the kitchen, uh, preparing the bill, um, uh, putting, uh, typing, uh, the order in the system and so on and so on. And then of course um, you are entering the line of visibility, which is front stage, uh, which where you welcoming uh, customers and so on and so on. Then there's the customer actions um, that are also have to be accounted for in the service um, design because um, this is what you uh, what you have to account for. So what, what is the action of the customer that, that does that? And then, of course, the physical evidence, you have to be always aware of that because this is not really, doesn't really directly influence something, but you have to have it for each uh, action. You have to have a certain uh, physical evidence that uh, works and that helps the customer in the end. Now, uh, blueprinting, we've been talking about a lot about this in class. Um, is this an applied process chart, map, and diagram? This is one blueprint that we've been looking at here. Uh, there are a lot of different designs, a lot of different iterations of that. Um, of course, but all have the same goal is to define the service as precisely as possible and then also, of course, leave no gaps there. And it's one of, one of the most wi widely uh, widely used tools um, in, the in the service positioning as well. And when do you use it? Of course, it's new service when you're hiring. Uh, knowledge scale attitude, KSA, as we've uh, seen and we're going to see later as well. And of course, in the reviewing process, uh, you have to have a blueprint because if you don't have a blueprint, you don't know what you're looking for. And this is really important that you have one of them, a blueprint. So it's very visible for you to evaluate what you're doing well or what you're doing not so well. Now, business uh, service and uh, business process improvement and business process re-engineering. Basically, a process requires one or more inputs and the output is then the value for the customer. That's what's what's the definition of a process. And it has to be, as we said before, clearly identified. If the process is not and the value of the customer is not clearly identified, then your process is rubbish. You can't do that. And there are, of course, primary and support uh, processes, management, and so on and so on, as we've seen before. BPR and BPM, business process, reengineering, and management. 
So what we have improvements are really that, this, of course, improvement is ongoing, as we've uh, talked about before, and it, can, it has limited organizational change uh, can be done. And of course, the regenerating is something that's project-based um, and will build a process from scratch and has, of course, a lot more uh, organizational change that you have if you have to re-engineer a whole process. But if you have an improvement, of course, you can always do that. And as we said with Juran in uh, chapter number one, Dr. Juran, um, and later as well, is that improvement and the process improvement should always be something that any, every employee can do. Uh, every engineer is something that's more on the management side. Plan to act check, PDCA, um, and it's always rotating and that's super important. Uh, very uh, few, four very uh, simple steps seemingly, but as management, as far as management goes, very hard to really follow through on every single step and be there at all times. This is one of the main challenges uh, that, that you will have. And then uh, we have, of course, Six Sigma, uh, where also we have a the mic um, process, which is basically the same as PDCA. There's a lot of those um, abbreviations going around because everyone thinks they've reinvented the wheel. Again, innovation is something that's taking being taken there and adapting it and making it a bit more specific. So the mic is define, measure, analyze, improve, or control, and is um, used. For for re-engineering, I see a mistake here on the slide, huh? uh, of existing processes. Then what problems can you have in a process is conformance, uh, efficiency, of course, uh, pro conformance is creates mainly customer satisfaction, something that, as we said uh, before, a process has to create a value uh, for the customer. If it doesn't create or even creates dissatisfaction, then, well, re-engineer it or get rid of it. Um, of course, efficiency is a problem. That's where you have to improve it, of course. And then you have the design design problems. And um, if you have design problems in your uh, processes, that's not really uh, what you want. And you have to, of course, adapt to that. Now, you have vertical organizations and process organizations. How do you do your work segmentation? Uh, mainly hierarchical. This is a vertical organization and many untrained employees with specialized tasks. Uh, this is the classical. Um, well, um, organization that you have is really uh, very specialized and it's very manageable because you can really uh, account for each step on the um, organization. Process organization is more broad, is uh, has few hierarchical levels, makes it a bit easier to communicate to switch between levels. Uh, the employees have been broadly trained and work in customer experience uh, and it's dynamic and complex and competitive and in a competitive environment. Now, service scape number five, uh, chapter number five already. So the service setting and environment is the service scape. It's what you are walking into when you're walking into a restaurant, it's what you're walking into when you're walking into a supermarket and so on and so on. But everything has, has been specifically designed for you to receive it that way. At least we hope so, because that's what we have to do. There's physical evidence, there's uh, complexity, um, so how complex is it? For example, IKEA is a very interesting uh, example there, of course. They're trying to redirect you through the whole shop and you get basically get lost. It's like a labyrinth. Um, so is this, this is part of the service scape of IKEA. And then you have a strong influence. Of course, um, on inexperienced customers and employees, the service scape, it's something that even if it's very nice at first, uh, at first you will then debunk it. And I'm sure a lot of you have uh, experience with that when you're going into a, into a place first time um, and you see, oh, everything is great, everything is fantastic. Um, and then you slowly start to see, okay, well, that's nice first impression, but well, in the end, it's not really that well. Um, and of course, service gives unlimited info, information on the product. Um, it, it's really about a larger picture and integrating uh, into the product and making basically representing the product that you want to actually sell in the end. Um, it's it's rather revelating of the hedonic service and rather than utility, it's not really useful in the end, the service scape, but it can enhance um, the service, of course. But of course, as we said before, it does not, not only affect the customer, but all, also the employees and service scape is part what's backstage and also what's front of the stage. 
and this will show in behavior. So you will see that maybe it's not the bad attitude of your employee that causes some customer dissatisfaction, but maybe you have to reevaluate your service scape and how you're treating the employees and how they are uh, they're viewing it. And of course, there are in, uh, four environmental roles, which is physical, holistic, internal response, and behavior. That are the different uh, four environment roles. Now, service scape, uh, flow management, uh, well organized product and process flow can enhance operational profit. Here we're seeing we again go it again for efficiency, and the better the process flows, uh, the higher, of course, your profit. And interesting here, of course, also music BPM can influence dining speed and spending. Um, here uh, as well with this is uh, that I've seen in a documentary as well is um, carpets. For example, carpets are installed in a um, store because you want people to walk um, slower. Apparently, through studies, people have... Uh, it's been shown that people who walk on carpets, they walk slower. So they spend more time and they look at products more closely, which is also why a uh, reason why I think you have a lot of uh, carpets in hotels, because you want people to relax and you want people to walk slow. And that's why it's a bit of um, a difference there. Aromatherapy, of course, a sense uh, that have an effect on the customer behavior. Um, there is a lot of uh, shops and restaurants uh, who are specializing their scents. They have, um, they're working with aromatherapy and having a specialized scent uh, for their establishment. And you, if you smell that, it triggers emotions and it triggers um, um, maybe nostalgia as well. So uh, it's very interesting there. And of course, colors, um, and because the brain remembers colors first, um, is something that, that's, that's really outstanding. And if you look at the logos of your favorite companies, you will see if you have this shade of orange, if you have this shade of um of gray or of any other color you automatically think of this one company because it's something that you have had uh, experience with he's not going to ask us too much about there is also detailed uh, on the on his slides detail on uh, non promotion other slides sorry detailed uh, analysis about colors we don't have to know that he said that in class and um, this is more just for our um, interest now culture leadership and values um one of Sorry guys, I seem to have lost you there. Could were you still able to hear me before? Guys. Yes, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Hear you no worries. Okay, yeah, I just I seem to have lost you there. Okay. okay, fantastic. Cool. Uh so culture. Uh what is culture? It's uh, beliefs, values, assumptions, and norms. It's something that is the large picture of your company and that's what what is uh, going on and it's people strategy environment and organization tasks who are shaping the culture and how is it communicated uh, through official statements oral uh, or written communication for example um, personal experience i've um, i'm working in um, a luxury hotel in, in july and august and they've given me a booklet uh, around, I don't know, 30 or 40 pages uh, where they explain to me what their um, culture is, uh, how you have to behave, and so on and so on, which is uh, it's quite official, of course, and if it's implemented. Of course, this is all very nice, how it's communicated, this is great, but then, of course, if don't, people don't act on it and if there is bad management and so on and so on, then we'll see that as well, that basically um, it doesn't work. And then we're going here for leadership by example, and this is in also uh, personal experiences, only the only way that leadership works is leading by example. And um, because leading by example is something that, uh, that you do every day. It's something that you are upholding your values, norms and beliefs um, that you are expecting from others. And it's also one of the hardest uh, styles definitely to manage people and to lead because uh, you have to kick yourself in the ass every single day yourself as a leader. Um, in order to do that. But if you're not willing to do that, then definitely this is not a, a leadership person. And this is also something that's how you can evaluate leadership. It's really, are they acting on what they preach? Um, 
for example, if they expect you to be every time 10 minutes early, are they every time 10 minutes or even 15 minutes early themselves or not? Or are they coming 10 minutes late? Well, then obviously there's a discrepancy there. And uh, we've also seen in this uh, those slides that middle management is the most important because they're really their, con their connection between top management and the employees. And if they don't work, then um, the whole culture will fall apart. If they're not believe if they don't know the culture themselves and they cannot implement it correctly to the staff because the staff is most likely to adapt it from from management. If you have a good manager, you're most likely to adapt it yourself. Um, and if you have bad management, uh, it doesn't work either. Um, of course, we can say about different management styles that don't work and different cultures that don't work, but that's basically we see that uh, and apparently it's evident that middle management is super important. Then of course X and Y theory. Um, and what there is either management works for staff um, or the other way around that's being seen but in the end um, what's the right the way of not the right way but is the the way that it's preferably has to be seen is uh, that management as a manager you're basically working for your staff you're facilitating you're empowering you are enhancing um, and you are trying to make them work better and make them feel better as well. In the end, of course, if uh, people uh, bullshit you, in the end, that's uh, a different story. But technically, as a manager, you're working for your staff and it's not the other way around um, because you have, you have more experience and you are responsible. It's really the I versus us, uh, collectivism versus individualism, that's really there. Um, and it's really important that's um, helping each other, of course, in a culture. Uh, is uh, the most important and if you can see that a lot if you if people talk a lot about uh, oh, I did this I did this blah 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 then you can already uh, pretty much predict that the culture might not be appropriate to um, a company and the company where a lot of people in, um, are involved in now uh, why do we have a well why culture um, well all firms have a culture of course um, unwillingly or willingly and this is important that actually you have to have a culture that you're willingly imposing or not imposing, but um, that you're de demonstrating as a business. Because if you're not doing that, then the um, culture will manage you. And that's something that uh, com can come back and bite you um, if you are not doing it. As social glue um, and anything else that they've been a list, you're not going to read all of it. Uh, this dimension measures uh, the extent to which uh, cultural socializes its members into accepting or, well, non ambiguous systems and tolerating uh, uncertainty, um, and so on and so on. Uh, countries exhibiting high uncertainty, avoidance, maintaining rigid codes of belief and behavior, and are intolerant and orthodox behavior and ideas, blah, blah, blah. The whole thing. Um, yeah, it's really about emotional needs that you, that you have. A decision are taken uh, are careful, uh, carefully analyzed, or have to be carefully analyzed uh, of, with all the available in, in, uh, information. And in the end, it all comes down to uh, well, two kind of different uh, um, culture uh, ways of um, having that uh, emotional uh, connection is either femininity or masculinity, where it's either nurture uh, versus power. How valid that is in the end, uh, well, it's being debated a lot at the moment. Uh, of course. Um, with feminism and uh, and how that's being viewed, but that's more than a political uh, topic there. Now, now we are looking at KSA, SOPs and service process management. Um, as we said before, KSA is knowledge, uh, skill and attitude um, is something that you're hiring for. So what do you know? It's critical thinking, decision making, etc., etc. Skills um, is what um, what you have is psychomotor skills and experience and then the attitude is what how you're motivated you are how your emotional intelligence and interpersonal skills and if you're really hiring for attitude you have would do a much better job in a lot of stuff so uh skill learning um and cognitive learning that we have here uh, cognitive learning we've seen this a lot as well in um i think even in f and b management in f and b cost control last semester uh, the teacher showed us pretty much the same pyramid. Um, this is how we sh how we are learning, and of course we all know this because uh, well we're all studying, and this is a cognitive learning process. 
And then, of course, you have skill learning, which is exposure acquisition, application, automatic use. And exposure is the first one, which where you're observing some uh, observing a skill. Acquisition is when you're doing it by repetition and you're trying it. Then you're applying it to a different situation other than a training situation. And at some point, you should be able to automatically use it. Now, uh, also a cycle of learning, as we have here. Um, and KSA, of course, links strongly to service blueprinting, and this is highly linked. So uh, its blueprinting is looking for SOPs. Uh, and if you have your SOPs, you know your knowledge, skill, and attitude um, of the person you're hiring and the position you want to fill. And that also comes back to the whole what the whole course is basically all about is, is you have to understand your service and then, of course, to hire the right people um, to do that. And it's not only the part of this course, but definitely understanding the service is anyways, in any case, uh, the most important thing. Then, um, well, service process management is a chain of experience-based activities um, and of course, effective functionality. And it's mostly dependent on human factors as well. So uh, services that we've seen are, as we've said before, are intangible. So human factors are hugely important there. Then cycle of learning, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and unconscious competence are the different ones that we've seen. It's basically linked to the ones I uh, just said before, order acquisition, application, automatic use. Your own aware of skill and lack of proficiency, something that you have not done or that you don't know really how to do well. Um, for example, um, baking a cake. Um, then, of course, you can do a conscious incompetence. You are aware of the skill, but you're not yet proficient. And then you go there um, pretty self-explanatory, I guess, to unconscious competence. That's then the automatic use of a skill, which is what you um, optimally strive for. Now, here we have the turtle method <clears throat> is an as-is analysis um, and takes uh, take a step back to the process and looks at the bigger picture. And a turtle has an input and an output, of course, as a turtle does, and well, all animals do in the end. Um, and then you have different inputs. What is going on in there? You have the resources, methods, measures, and um, resources in people and resources in um, things. And that's basically how you are doing this approach. And if, you if you're doing that uh, turtle method, um, you can basically understand uh, all processes and links uh, how they are linked to each other. And if you're taking this step back, it's much easier than again to uh, man manage your processes because you have a global picture over everything that goes on. And there, uh, there's a lot of uh, very nice flowcharts that have been done. Of course, here again, line of visibility uh, and so on and so on, well, also linked into blueprinting. And there is the SIPOC. Nice here, just how can you build a flow chart? And if you're interested, this, these are the different symbols that are most widely uh, uh, used and how that's being done. Um, well, the questions uh, that you have to ask yourself for a flow chart are basically, is it logical? Does it add value? Um, does the process add value? Uh, what can be eliminated and uh, combined? And what are the bottlenecks? So this is everything if you're really building a flow chart and if you're serious about doing that then you re and if you include everything that you do then you can really start moving things around and having a macro perspective and trying to um to optimize it and of course sops then again you have to constantly review them train for them etc um as we've seen in class before now hiring and training we've uh, talked also a lot about that in hpp last semester um of course higher staff turnover adds to mid massive additional cost um, and according to Jack Welch uh, HR is the most important department in your uh, company because of course that's also then linked again to the culture it's also then linked again to the performance and of course if you don't know your service processes you cannot and you don't do your blueprinting right you cannot define the right SOPs then you cannot write, hire the right people and that will of course then um, interfere with this process as well um, yeah Basically, that's it. Well, recruiting is basically um, generating a pool of suitable candidates. And then the selection is uh, to identify the most suitable candidate uh, from the pool. So, yeah, that's basically it. And also, you have, of course, different sources uh, you can use for 
identifying those uh, potential candidates. Now, hiring and training, uh, the global objective of selection, um, well, it's company skill and job fit. It's, of course, you have to have the best match. Then um, when you're hired, you normally go through an induction phase where you're getting uh, new stuff acquainted with the company, with the company culture. That's what I'm, in my case, now getting uh, with the booklet, of course, and then also um, being shown around the hotel um, or being shown how uh, this evolved um, and getting uh, to understand experience what the hotel wants me to perform. Then the performance evaluation is super important in the hiring and training process, of course. You have to define and measure and evaluate. This is super important because um, if you're not defining well what you're evaluating the performance on, then you cannot give appropriate feedback. And then it's, well, you did, you did a bad job. Well, that's very cool, very nice. Thank you very much for that. But uh, you don't really know how to, if it's not measured and it's not defined, and if it's not communicated with the employee, it's really uh, hard and can actually work counterintuitively, uh, counterproductively, sorry, um, to the result. And of course, the feedback has to be ideally 360 degree appraisal. So how everyone uh, views it, uh, top management, supervisors, peers, subordinates, uh, set yourself, you have to validate yourself, it's very important as well, and the customer. And of course, then you can find the matching points and of course the discrepancies where it's being seen. And then we have been talking about the Pygmalion effect. I'm well almost sure that he's going to bring a question like that on the exam. Um, Pygmalion effect is what we've all seen in HPP last semester. You are have you have you have ex expectations for yourself and for other people, whether they be high or low. Um, the higher the expectations, the higher the performance. And what we've been looking at is the experiment with uh, students that. Just a teacher has been told by the researchers that those few kids, they are actually very, uh, they're going to be very successful. They're very intelligent. And the re for the rest, they didn't say anything. And even though the, there, were, there was no scientific evidence for that claim to make, the teacher believed it and actually um, really more encouraged those students more. And those students then performed significantly better, even though there was no evidence necessarily for their intelligence and this is really important to be aware of that the big melon effect um, because this is how you can influence yourself it's how you are viewing yourself if you have high expectations of yourself it's most likely that you're performing higher yourself as well it's something that you can use in your studies as well um, and if you of course it works the inverse as well if you have low expectations of someone then the chances that they're going to work uh, they're going to match those expectations is much higher because you're also then acting, taking subconscious actions to uh, confirm with that. Now, uh, training is, well, is out, comes ideally after performance evaluation, obviously, and you have to do a skill uh, gap analysis. And then, of course, how effective it is. It's really important that it's going to be evaluated over time and will not necessarily be seen tomorrow, but mostly in, in, a, in a few um, weeks, months, or even uh, years. And of course, as we said here, there's a lot of different methods that you can train. Uh, mentoring, coaching, shadowing, on versus off job, cross-functional, simulations, computer at home, uh, role play, virtual reality, everything. So um, simulations, for example, a lot of pilots lose, use that. Um, that's how you do, tra you do training there. Um, shadowing is something that's very popular in the hotel. Um, uh, industry where you're basically walking around with someone and they show you and you observe them how they do stuff. Um, it's actually more important than marketing because a satisfied customer uh, is the best publicity. Uh, so if you have well-trained staff, then your customer, of course, will be happier, most likely. And well, this is the best publicity that we know. So uh, learning organization, what is that? Um, it's all good to um, transfer to offer training but it's also about learning and about information sharing it's about systematic problem solving past experiences and so on and so on and for example what a learning organization is is for example that an experienced employee who is for example maybe 60 years old they can introduce uh, a 20 year old employee and give them all their experience and but also as a company offering this platform for this exchange to happen 
Then we have uh, different uh, types of learning, single loop, um, double loop and triple loop. What is a single loop is basically you have a consequence and you um, your action strategies um, are adapted immediately. This is, for example, if you have to, if the soup is too cold for a customer, for example. Okay, well, what do you do? You definitely directly go and heat it up and it's immediate, but it's not very long lasting. Now, taking the example of the, of the, of the soup, then what double uh, loop learning would be after service, you would see, okay, what are the reasons um, why the soup was cold? Maybe there was a process error in the kitchen. Maybe there was a process error in service where they were leaving it at the pass um, too long in the kitchen. And then you are uh, then adapting the strategies, which is the medium term. And triple loop would be then, well, your question in the context. Okay, uh, what, what did we learn and how uh, was the learning itself? produced and this then allows you to reproduce um, something that's better in the future and that's basically triple loop learning now motivation um, it's a motif and needs uh, desires wants um, and our drivers basically and it's either extrinsic or in intrinsic as we know and there is system-wide and individual um, motivation as well here we go, a uh, system-wide extrinsic, which is be insurance benefits, for example. Uh, individual extrinsic would be large uh, merit increase. Uh, intrinsic is, well, the preferred uh, motivation type, of course, uh, because it's something that you're feeling, uh, it's coming from your uh, from inside and that you want to perform in. That's, for example, Maslow's pyramid is very important there. For example, if you're going for a steam, this is really at this level that you're um, being motivated. It's um, it's about the recognition in the organization. That's something there. And of course, incentives. And now about motivation is as well, is who's sinking your boat? Um, is that was the question that's being asked in class. And it's, well, um, the, the basic concept of who is uh, ne bringing negative emotion and who is dragging motivation down. There's, for example, negative people who are always complaining. Um, and with no real uh, reason and they can drag down and well sink the boat of the team right? because they can drag down the whole team and you have to identify those people and get rid of them as soon as possible um, because this though they are uh, well uh, affecting the performance of everyone else and of course if you're the more engaged your uh, your employees are the better their performance and this is really about uh, actively uh, going up to them and showing your employees that you're they're engaged in the whole process and they're engaged in the company decisions. And yeah, as we said before, here we come into the loyal customers. Um, it's well, they increase the revenue by a lot, and the revenue costs almost uh, nothing, and that's all. Um, yeah, due to also then your employees. We have different questions. Uh, Gallops questions. Here we go. Uh, uh, do you know what you expect at work and all of that uh, at work do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day and so on and so on and this all of this is basically um, to answer how engaged or how to measure how or assess how engaged you are at work and as well of course as this is a question questionnaire that could be handed out to employees and they could um, fill it out and give it back and so management can see, okay, how engaged are they? And then you can definitely tack specifically tackle uh, how uh, engaged and how you improve engagement of uh, your employees. Now, motivation and empowerment. Um, we've been talking, this is quite recent as well, but empowerment is basically you're assigning authority uh, to influence the organization and you define boundaries. It's something that you let someone basically uh, lose themselves, but you just have a left and right boundaries uh, so they can they know where they can move in. And they might make the service slower, of course, because a person who's unexperienced, they might not take the right decisions or eff efficient decisions or effective decisions. So that take, might take a bit of a longer time. But in the end, uh, you have happier employees because if you the sense of accomplishment is much different if you are empowered than rather than delegated which is basically just an assignment of tasks, which is what people do normally in their jobs. Um, and of course, in both uh, ways, either, either empowerment or delegation, communication, feedback and trust are always needed. 
you can't trust someone with uh, you can't someone that you don't trust delegate something and of course then definitely not in power. So that's the different uh, different steps. Now here as well the the graph um, is uh, directive behavior and uh, supportive behavior. There's few uh, four uh, different managerial uh, leadership styles you have, uh, which goes go in different directions. I think also quite clear here and pretty self-explanatory. Now, uh, understanding the customer. So, well, what um, is the customer buying? Uh, is it a primary or secondary customer? So a primary customer is someone that's buying the product that is intended to use it for themselves. And a secondary customer is someone who the product is bought for, but are in the end the end user. And this is, for example, the uh, very prominent example of baby food, right? Well, the baby doesn't have doesn't have any money, so they can't buy the food. So the parents buy it for them, and the baby is consuming it. Um, yeah. Then the consumer is the use of the product and the service, which is then uh, what the end uh, co uh, consumer is. And gestology is knowing and understanding the customer, and it's an ongoing process. Well, of course, yeah, this might adapt. And you can use qualitative and quantitative research. That's what we're doing in uh, marketing quite a lot. You have to understand what the customer is and how he's behaving. Um, have um, our customers changed? That's also an interesting question to ask because as we said before, is nothing is really static. It's all, um, even though your demographic might be quite stable over a long period of time, this might change at some point because they're outgrowing uh, your product. And what is what are the implications for that? And then you have to have a coping strategy for them as well. This is then also about the agility of your um, of your company. Now, if we're looking at the right part, it's the satisfaction and loyalty. Um, uh, well, the four different stages. Uh, you have if you have low satisfaction and uh, low loyalty, then those are the factors. They're not gonna really um, come back, of course, and they will not uh, will not. Uh, join the service and they will go away. Further left from that, you have the terrorists. And those are the ones who are trying to destroy, actively dis seek to destroy your business because of they are not loyal, of course, and they're not satisfied. This might be, nowadays you can manif manifest it in online reviews, um, really bad or active sabotage um, that they're conductive. Then, of course, uh, satisfaction, if, if satisfaction is high, but loyalty is low. Those are the kind of mercenaries. They are, um, well, moving around a lot of companies, but they will come back to you eventually at some point, uh, but uh, just not very frequently. Then the hostages are the ones that are very loyal and uh, but sometimes dissatisfied. This is uh, mostly, in, well, this is basically in, uh, in markets where there is monopoly or duopoly. Um, for example, in Switzerland, we have the... Um, the railway services and all public transportations are uh, among one umbrella, which is called the CFA for SBB, uh, and you can't deviate from them at all because this is one company that is basically uh, well controlling that. It's part partially state-owned, so you're really even if you're not satisfied, even if the train is late, uh, you cannot really do anything else if you want to use public transportation unless you buy a car. But that's then a different service. And then of course, high satisfaction, high loyalty are loyalists. And even the top, the complete contrary from the terrorists are the apostles. Those are the ones who are actively trying to um, promote your business and they're actively trying to um, to engage and get more clients. And this is what um, influencer marketing is kind of trying to um, mimic, more or less, how believable that is. It's definitely debatable, but of course, uh, companies are trying to get those people who are influencers um, on social media to promote the product and to really uh, praise the company, which sometimes is quite funny to watch uh, if people are reviewing stuff and uh, advertising stuff that they have absolutely no clue about. Uh, I highly recommend if you're having a ta uh, staying a break of studying, uh, paying attention to some of the advert ads that uh, influencers do there. Quite uh, uh, entertaining. Now, I understand the customers is between different expectations, wants and needs. Um, are they aligned? What are the needs and wants? If Are they actually um, on the same level or not? And how can you bring them there? Then, of course, you have different zones of tolerance. Um, the zones of tolerances are basically the smaller, uh, for important factors, 
there's a smaller margin of tolerance uh, for and desired for adequate uh, service. Of course, important factors of this of the service. Those are the ones that you have the least um, tolerance about. And of course, for less important factors, you have a larger margin of tolerance uh, for the desired and the adequate service. And here we are at the previously mentioned lifetime value of customer. And this can, of course, be calculated. Um, we're not going to do that right now. And it's also numerical in this class, but uh, it can be done. Um, and then, of course, again, the same, almost the same as we had in the previous slide is from terrorist to fan. Um, how do you get there uh, and how is the retention as well? And then, of course, we are here looking at um, how you can retain um, and retain people and where you have to uh, get them. And it's actually the exponential um, growth, as you can see here. It's not really uh, just a straight line. There is a lot of uh, people who are not going to be loyal at some point, but then as soon as you get uh, to a certain point where the zone of indifference is uh, almost passed, and you can really uh, start to see a kick off there. Now, uh, there are different customers, of course, the complaining customers, um, the me customers, those are the ones who don't complain, which is really uh, difficult. And this is one of the most tricky clients to spot because, of course, they don't say anything, but you still have to spot them and to um, see how you can improve that. And if you if you achieve to do that, then that's, of course, uh, really uh, what, good for your business. And of course, for uh, for you as an employee, you have to be highly trained and very emotionally intelligent to see if a person has actually received uh, uh, well, the, the service that they need. Then it's aggressive uh, customer, of course, we've all seen those. Uh, of course, maybe some, guys, some of you guys in your internships as well. Uh, loud and lengthy complaints, uh, can be uh, at least and uh, just trying to uh, to yeah are really uh, losing their mind. Then there's the high roller. Um, they expect only the best, but are willing to pay for it. And the complaints are normally reasonable. So those are mostly, in my experience, most five star uh, guests uh, in hotels are really like that. They they expect the best. They definitely want that because they're paying for it. But they also are very generous if they are. Um, if they're being offered a service. And if something goes wrong during their stay, normally they're not, well, most of them are not, um, are very fairly reasonable and then just tell them, okay, well, that was not good. Uh, may I get something else? Or may I get some more ice? I order with ice or without ice. So it's, it's perfectly, normally perfectly reasonable. And then there's the rip-off customer. Of course, those are the ones who just complain to get something for free. Um, yes, that's uh, very much that. And this is even more so nowadays with the online, um, review session uh, where you can basically um, be a tyrant as a customer and uh, put a lot of pressure on a business um, by doing that. And there, are, of course, there's the chronic complainers. Um, it's always something wrong. Um, always, always, uh, even if it's something that's so minor, um, that's uh, the same. So, for example, I have a, uh, an anecdote there in the hotel I was working in before. Uh, we had a client who always came in and she was complaining that it's too cold. Well, we put the heating elements uh, beside her table always in the restaurant, um, but then uh, she still complained about that. And at some point, it's just uh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, and uh, yeah, quite uh, quite funny and also sometimes tragic to to see those uh, examples. Then um, we've been talking about the values before, and then we have been talking about the this is in lesson one about that um, functional experiential experiential symbolic and cost sacrifice and financial value. That's what we've been talking about. This is now from definitely from a customer perspective. And we've been talking about quality perspectives in chapter one. This is where this uh, model comes back here. Now, service quality, gap analysis. Um, those are the five different gaps. Uh, there was a chart on his slides. I've just uh, uh, compressed it a little bit here. So there's the management perception of customer expectations and the gap one is is the real customer exp expectations. What is the gap there and it, is there a gap? Then second one is management perceptions and customer expectations and then the management perception. And this can go to service quality specifications. Now, management perception of surf, service quality uh, specifications, then also service quality specifications uh, influence service quality delivery. Is this the specifications are those the same as the service that's being delivered? Then external communication to customers, 
um, in the service delivery, um, well, is what's being consumed, uh, communicated to the customer, uh, also what's being delivered, and of course the perceived service and the expected service. So this is of course then meeting expectations or exceeding expectations, and this is the fifth point that uh, we're always being taught in uh, in hotels, right? You have to, or in hospitality here especially, you have to exceed um, uh, the the perceived service. You have to exceed their expectations. Well. That's uh, that's then the, this gap analysis gap number five. Um, now dimensions are tangibles, reality, reliability, responsiveness, assurance, and empathy. Those are different um, service quality dimensions. Um, anything that's tangible, um, equipment, facilities, etc. Reliability uh, is it is services promised or um, well handling service problems? Um, how is being handled? Customer service is there as well. And responsiveness is how to inform customers, um, prompt service and the willingness to help uh, something as well. Uh, for example, responsiveness is something that's, uh, of course, very important in the first aid um, businesses, of course. Then assurance um, is something that is your service, is your service uh, instilling <clears throat> confidence, uh, feeling of safety in the customer or not. And of course, empathy. And this is individual attention, paying individual attention to every single guest and client that you have. And you have to have, of course, the best intended heart and understand the needs. And um, yeah, you have to, have, of course, convene the business hours. Otherwise, they will not be able to reach you. Now, capacity management. Um, <clears throat> one of the last chapters we had. Um, queuing, of course, is Murphy's law. Um, something, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Um, always when you go in, like if there's two queues, if you try to go into this hour, try to decide to stand at one queue, there definitely the other queue is going to progress uh, quicker. That's always the case for some reason. Um, and of course, queuing can produce violence and rage if badly managed. This is being seen at sometimes at concerts, at football matches, and of course, uh, sometimes at restaurants as well. Um, queuing is a bottleneck. Um, <clears throat> and it's limiting the capacity in, in the processes. Uh, so if people are queuing, then you have to ask yourself, okay, what is what is the limiting capacity and what is the limiting process that um, does not allow me to um, to proceed? Which, for example, of course, in, in a concert when you have a security check, then of course that's something that you can't avoid. Now, virtual queuing, um, something that's even um, uh, more prominent now. It's, for example, if um, you're launching a new website and you're uh, announcing a product on a website that's uh, done with a few uh, online businesses, if you're announcing a new product and everyone wants to order it online because certain companies nowadays, they don't have stores anymore, so they cr they crash the website because the servers can't handle, and then you're being basically uh, bought in a, in, a, in a virtual queue. And then, of course, that's also uh, something that you have to manage. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you have to, different factors are average waiting time, length of the wait, the total time spent in the company and the service time. All of this is uh, can, has to be taken into account in order to uh, reduce queuing to its minimum. Now, um, perceived shorter wait time, um, and those are all psychological aspects and longer wait time. So if the employees are friendly, of course, the wait seems shorter. Um, if the first uh, wait is annoying, but the second one is short. Um, uh, sorry, the first one is good, and the uh, second one is uh, short, uh, but annoying. Uh, then the second one will seem much longer, and that's just a um, psychological effect. And the first one is long, and the second one is short. Um, the second one will feel even shorter in contrast, which is um, being perceived like that. And of course, uh, longer waiting time is pre-process wait, in-process, and post-process wait. They all accumulate in the end. Um, if you know the duration, if you know how long you have to wait, then you will be much happier. So, for example, in the post office in uh, Switzerland, you will have to have a ticket uh, when you go to the post office and they will tell you um, you're being served in this many minutes or not really because they will just you have basically a letter or a number there. And then you see your number or the previous numbers uh, displayed on the screen and how it's progressing. So you kind of know and can more or less estimate your um, waiting time, which makes it uh, perceived shorter. Um, then 
if uh, yeah, the group weight of course are do feel shorter because you can interact with people, and if you're happy or sad, the rest is pretty straightforward. Um, and of course, if you have a more valuable service, then you're willing to wait longer. That's why, for example, for certain restaurants, um, people are willing to wait because outside because uh, they really want that experience um, with especially hyped hyped goods. Uh, for example, I think in uh, New York was that the Cronut, something like that, that was a new invention of a, of a bakery. Um, it's an item that everyone wants, and because this service is valuable to them, they were willing to wait sometimes three, four hours uh, there. Now, queue management systems, uh, they reduce the wait time, improve and cost saving, of course, um, and have more satisfied employees and customers because it's less stressful for employees as well if you have a well-managed queue and, of course, have your customers when they enter your service. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, it gets a better response time. Um, capacity um, is something that's important. Um, if you know that you're going to run out of capacity, then you close doors. Um, demand to match uh, to match the capacity. You have to have the uh, or do you have to have the capacity to match the demand. Of course, you have to expand if you have constantly uh, too much demand. Um, sometimes you have to allow line and divert um, and do nothing if line is, is if creates uh, de desirability. So, like uh, as a restaurant, for example, uh, if there is people queuing outside, it normally creates uh, desirability and people say, really, "Oh, that's interesting." Why are so many people there? Well, it's probably because there's very good food there. So, uh, number 12, evaluating and managing service quality with decision-making. Um, decision-making is um, about weighing positives and negatives uh, and forecast each outcome. Um, it's an ongoing process and it has to be evaluated with alternatives and achieve objectives. So, what are different systems? Um, well, you're thinking, seeing, and doing. Uh, SAR is situation, action, and result. Those are different systems that you are taking if you're uh, doing a risk uh, an analysis of the preliminary analysis of the problem identification and assessment of the situation. And then you have the Mintzberg model of strategy for decision making, which is entrepreneurial. Um, st strategy made by powerful individuals, adaptive, uh, modeling through, and it's very reactive. And then you have the planning, which is systematic uh, gathering of information and then analysis there. This is, uh, those are different uh, points here. Now, how are the different, how can you uh, take decisions? There are different, four different systems that we've, or four different models that we've looked at. It's deduction, it's conclusion. Um, it's true if the pr premises are true. Uh, it's reliable or all premises are true. Uh, well, as if you go from a general perspective, basic to a particular um, decision, and and uh, go from there. Then induction is casual relations. Um, you go from a generalization to go to a problem, and then uh, just from a sample to a population. So you can really um, you abstract from there. And um, there can also be, of course, strong and weak induction. And there, abduction is uh, the question of why. Um, we are, you're basically explaining uh, apparently unrelated facts, uh, tactic reasoning, uh, focus on the explanation, and abductive generalization is end picture vision until better solution alternatives are found. So you basically don't know what's going on, but you still you go uh, to a certain uh, extent and then see if you have a better alternative found or not. And heuristics is a particular approach and works for the current situation. Um, it's very quick, but it's uh, sometimes can lead to, of course, uh, problems because you're taking shortcuts. Um, you, and for the heuristic generalization, you're really starting at the starting picture, and it's valid for mostly only a single instance there. Now, alternatives. You have to find all possible alternatives, know all aspects and, well, possible alternatives. This is important because sometimes there is stuff that we've seen also VUCA before, that you cannot anticipate. Um, so you have to factor in as many different um, alternatives as possible. So your decision and is basically as coherent and as flexible as possible. Uh, well, then intuitive um, decision making, of course, is something that's um, charged by judgment and it's rapid, unconscious and holistic. 
normally it's based on your experience it's very much connected to your emotions uh, when do you have to use intuitive um, um, uh, decision making is well basically when there's time constraints and that's also then links again to the model of skills um, of the learning that's then an automated skill automated skill right if uh, you have to be in a first aid situation for example and if you've trained if your first aid um, instructor for example and you're uh, arriving at a situation like that that is more likely that you intuitive decisions are the right ones and they're saving time and saving lives apparently in the end then um well if they because there's not a lot of time and uh, for fast-paced events uh, poorly structured problems sometimes if the problem is not structured at all and you cannot really take a good decision by planning and by um uh, applying a process then that's also a factor and um, if factors are hard to take into account, if you don't really know what you're dealing with and what factors might influence it, then of course, that's also when you have to take intuitive decisions. And of course, different information, conflicting and ambiguous um, information as well there, uh, in fact, all factoring in there. Now, um, obstacles and difficulties, as we've talked about, really it's about external and internal influences. Um, and it's complicated in the decision-making process. Psychological, sociological, and political, PSP, very big um, factors, of course, where you really, um, that you really cannot take into account and you really cannot influence. Um, so you have to adapt as your decision-making as much as possible to uh, those factors, but you cannot never fully uh, include all the factors there. There are seven steps of efficient decision-taking. It's identification, um, identify the decision, gather information, identify alternatives, weigh the evidence, choose alternatives, take action, and review decision. That's always, always, always important. Last step, number seven, review your decisions um, after taking actions, of course, uh, because then, of course, for the next decision, you have to uh, be better and improve or keep it uh if it was good. That's um, always uh, important that as we've seen through a lot of different topics that we've been talking about in this recap and of, of course during the semester that reviewing and really taking a step back and uh, evaluating and that's also another link to learning single, double or triple loop learning where you have to review all of those steps. Uh, now there is a few different uh, charts here. Pareto chart again. Um, yeah. Uh, the importance and performance. Uh, then we have here a fishbone, a uh, fishbone model, uh, and the performance. Well, about performance, it's really uh, assessing quality after service experience. Uh, guest questionnaire tool for free number, uh, survey uh, tool free number, uh, survey focus group, uh, mystery shopper, etc. That's all different uh, ways of how you can evaluate performance, and of course benchmarking, which then links to the service quality gap analysis that we've did before. With those benchmarks, you can uh, actually evaluate the performance of the whole organization um, and, well, evaluate them, of course, then, and take action if necessary. Well, guys, uh, that was it so far. Uh, I don't know how much time I used. Um, yeah, almost one and a half hours. Or how long was it? Yeah, almost one and a half hours. So uh, a bit longer than I've... Uh, intended to. Um, I hope you guys didn't fall asleep. I hope it was somewhat interesting. Of course, it's a bit. It was a, very much a general recap of everything, and you could go much more into detail into every topic. But I hope that was uh, useful, guys. I hope you can use the slides as well, maybe for your exam as well. So, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask now. Or, uh, yeah. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome, guys. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you very much. Nice. Thank you. Have a great time. Great day, guys. A great weekend. Um, enjoy it. Uh, have a great uh, last two exams hospitality, economics, and service quality uh, and design. Uh,